Okay, with that, Dr. Zacks. <coughs> Thanks, Jim. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks to all of you. Good morning. And uh, you know the expression, every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Well, today you have Tom, Dick, and Jerry, and Leanne, and Nancy. <coughs> and I noticed that this uh, is supported by Ibsen, and Ibsen and Lexicon are the ones who brought us Telotrostat, which is very helpful. So thanks to them. I have a net, a neuroendocrine tumor. Why focus upon the heart? And what's a cardiologist doing on my team anyway? So I hope that by the end of my comments, you will agree that um, uh, I can c keep working, but I want you to put me out of business. Okay, I'm trying to advance it, Jim. Okay, so my disclosure is that I'm a member of the advisory board of Lexicon pertaining to carcinoid heart disease and its role or potential role in there. So today I'll say a few comments about the epidemiology or the incidence the etiology or cause of carcinoid heart disease, the pathoanatomy, that's the functional and anatomic manifestations of carcinoid heart disease, the treatment of carcinoid heart disease, the important perioperative management. Uh, my role is to help protect the carcinoid patient through procedures. The timing of procedures, what do you, what do you fix first? The, do you get rid of tumor first or fix the heart first? That's a problem that I'm gonna discuss with you. And other concerns pertaining to the carcinoid patient. And then a brief case presentation. You notice that I'm gonna do the case presentation at the end as opposed to at the beginning. That's, uh, that's our final exam, mine and yours and then what it all means to the patient. The incidence of car carcinoid cancer ranges from three to four patients per 100,000 population per year, according to studies in the USA. It's approximately double that in a study in Sweden, and we suspect that it just depends upon how you look for the disease. I suspect that Sweden is closer to the truth. At the time of diagnosis, 20 to 30 percent of patients have metastatic disease and carcinoid syndrome, with flushing in 90 percent, diarrhea in 70 percent, heart involvement in about a third, and wheezing in 15%. And carcinoid heart disease may be the initial presentation of carcinoid cancer in as many as 20% of patients. And of course, this remains a major, major cause of concern because of its morbidity and mortality. Concerning the etiology of carcinoid heart disease, Maria Spatz did very important work with a guinea pig model in 1964. And she saw that to create experimental carcinoid heart disease, there had to be three derangements, three abnormalities. One is you had to have liver involvement. You had to have injury to the liver. Number two, you had to have an elevated serotonin level and number three, you had to have the consequence of that overturning of serotonin, which is tryptophan deficiency, which results from the excessive production of serotonin. The treatment pearl here is that tryptophan deficiency, tryptophan is a building block of niacin, it's treated with niacin. So 
So about the pathoanatomy, serotonin secreted in high concentration in the liver stimulates receptors on the inner lining of the heart causing scarring of the inner lining or we, we call it fibroblast proliferation. Severe fibrotic endocardial pearly plaques form on this inner surface of the heart and it's due to high serotonin levels. Structural changes occur not only on the inner lining, but in the valve leaflets, deforming the valves. And the problem is mainly in the right-sided valves, the tricuspid and pulmonic. If left-sided involvement is noticed, you have to think of what's causing the left heart to be involved, because the lungs are supposed to deactivate serotonin. So if you see left-hearted involvement, we think of bronchial carcinoid tumors secreting substances directly to the left heart valves. A shunt, like a patent foramen ovale, or an atrial septal defect, or just very, very high serotonin levels. There's a clinical pearl here, and that is that we monitor tumor markers, urinary 5-hydroxyindolacetic acid, which is a breakdown product of serotonin, and we do blood testing for markers, blood serotonin, chromogranin A, pancreastatin, and neuro, neuro, neuron-specific enolase, and we have as our goal, we haven't achieved this yet, of finding a workable bradykinin assay because we believe that it's a very important player in the carcinoid crisis. It's interesting. In a test tube, a suspension of fibroblasts, when you add serotonin to it, the fibroblasts proliferate. And it has been noted that if you add omega-3 fish oil, it inhibits this effect. So there's a clinical pearl here, and that is our carcinoid patients are treated with pro-omega, which is a purified processed omega-3 fish oil. This is a transverse cut, a caricature of the four valves. And you can see I've marked it left and right on the left, down at the bottom is the mitral valve, and in the center is its associated aortic valve, and on the right, the tricuspid valve. Whoops, I want to go back if I can. And the up at top here, the pulmonic valve. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. This slide is echocardiographic images of normal tricuspid and mitral valves. And we only have to pay attention to this image over here. And I'll try to demonstrate for you the thinness of the linear tri uh, tricuspid valve here. And adjacent to that, right next to it, is the mitral valve, the left heart valve. Both of them have just little lines which meet in the center. That's the important thing. They're thin lines and they meet in the center. Ah, sorry. This slide shows the, this is an enlargement This is an enlargement of the tricuspid valve. And you'll notice that in the center where the arrow is, there's a density which represents the tip of the third leaflet of the tricuspid valve. They are closed. They are meeting in the center. This is normal. This is the echocardiography of tricuspid on the left and pulmonic on the right. 
you will notice that the leaflets are not closing. They are supposed to be closed here. They're more dense, they're thickened. And there's a blue line indicating that there's an inappropriate flow of blood across that valve when it's supposed to be closed. So this valve is not only thickened, but it's also regurgitant. It's leaking when it's supposed to be closed. And we have the same situation. This is not even coming close to being closed. And the leaflets are dense, fibrotic, and pulled out to the side. So these are valves that are affected by the fibrosis of carcinoid heart disease. This is another echocardiographic image of a diseased tricuspid valve. And over here are the valve leaflets which are not closing. And down below, there is not supposed to be all of this yellow stuff when the valve is supposed to be closed. There's supposed to be no blood flow across that valve. This valve is retracted thickened and leaking. It's fixed in one position. And it's also somewhat narrowed, although we can't demonstrate that here. This is a similar rendition of that phenomenon of the thickening, retraction, and not meeting in the center of the pulmonic valve. So most commonly, the, both the pulmonic and tricuspid valves are affected in patients with carcinoid heart disease. These are two images of the same valve, tricuspid valve, at the time of surgery. And, you know, these valve leaflets are supposed to be paper thin. And in this case, what you see here is this gaping fish mouth like appearance of a valve which is stuck in the open position. And down below is this typical pearly placking. This is just scar tissue, abnormal scar tissue forming around the valve on the surface of the heart. And to the right is the same valve with Dr. Adams, the surgeon, inserting an instrument to show you, pull down the leaflet to its closed position to show you how thick and scarred that leaflet is. Carcinoid tumors have been termed secretors and non-secretors, functional and non-functional. Those which secrete substances which produce symptoms are termed functional and those which are non-secretors of substances creating symptoms are non-functional, they, they create no syndrome. The carcinoid syndrome, therefore, is by definition caused by a functional tumor. Carcinoid heart disease occurs in 50% of patients with the carcinoid syndrome at some time during their disease. Now, it's important to, I'm going to, to be redundant in my talk, you'll see to try to emphasize a few principles. It's important to understand that carcinoid heart disease is not, in 95% of cases, is not tumor in the heart. It's the effects of the substances secreted by tumors that's creating the scarring and the disease. Only 5% have cardiac metastases. Functional carcinoid cancer releases vasoactive substances, including serotonin, which stimulates serotonin receptors resulting in fibroblast proliferation, the scar formation on the inner lining of the heart. Somatostatin is an inhibitory peptide. There are six somatostatin genes in vertebrates, only one in humans. Somatostatin receptors facilitate inhibition there are five somatostatin receptors, and we're particularly interested in somatostatin receptor number two because somatostatin analogs, octreotide, lanreotide, and passereotide, are active at that somatostatin receptor. So serotonin 
secreted by carcinoid tumors is a major contributor to the carcinoid syndrome. It stimulates the serotonin receptors in the heart. And the clinical pearl here is that somatostatin analogs have affinity somati to somatostatin receptor number two, suppressing neuroendocrine tumor growth by suppressing tumor growth factors and inhibiting tumor release of vasoactive substances, including, very importantly, serotonin and bradykinin. The carcinoid syndrome, the features, are caused by the release of pharmacologically active mediators, including 5-hydroxytryptamine, that's serotonin, prostaglandins, kinins, including bradykinin, very important, substance P, it might be more important than we've realized in causing the carcinoid cancer uh, of the heart, um, gastrin, somatostatin, corticotropin, and neuron-specific enolase, releasing them into the peripheral circulation, causing flushing, diarrhea, wheezing, and carcinoid heart disease. A carcinoid crisis is extreme, uncontrollable flushing, diarrhea, wheezing, and or marked increase or decrease of blood pressure. The clinical pearl here is that we use octreotide and solucortef as the mainstays of carcinoid crisis treatment. So carcinoid heart disease is caused by a high concentration of serotonin secreted by a large burden of metastases in the liver or by tumor in the ovaries. You know, you can have carcinoid heart disease without liver involvement if it's created by tumor in the ovaries because that bypasses the circulation through the liver and goes directly to the heart. The right heart is more commonly involved, as I mentioned, the tricuspid and pulmonic valves. Less common is involvement of the mitral valve and the aortic valve. And the reason for the predominance of right heart involvement is that serotonin carried predominantly in platelets is inactivated in the lungs. If there's left heart involvement, we look for a hole in the heart, which is an atrial septal defect or a patent foramenal valley, and this has to be fixed at the time of surgery. Carcinoid tumor of the chest or lungs called bronchial, bronchial carcinoid secretes serotonin directly affecting the left heart valves, the mitral and aortic valves or you, one can have an extremely high concentration of serotonin which gets to the left side of the heart through the pulmonary circulation. It overpowers the lung's ability to deactivate serotonin. The consequences of right heart failure are edema, ascites, and effusions. The earliest sign of right heart failure will be a congested liver and edema of the feet, then the ankles. Then as it progresses, it comes up the leg. And then when it reaches the waist, it involves the development of fluid in the abdomen, which is called ascites. That's associated with edema of the bowel. That causes malabsorption, ultimate malnutrition, which we have termed cardiac cachexia. If one has congestion of the liver from this back pressure from the failing heart, there is a high risk of bleeding were a surgeon to try to do an abdominal tumor reductive procedure. So this dictates the therapeutic sequence of procedures. In this case, when there's high pressure in the liver, we advise fix the heart first. Pleural effusions develop as the fluid level rises further, and this causes shortness of breath due to pulmonary edema, 
and restriction of lung expansion. So the treatment of carcinoid heart disease, the primary most effective treatment is valve surgery. Surgery involves fixing, in most instances, the pulmonic and tricuspid valves. We replace them, and we are then, when we have made a decision to do that, we are faced with the choice of which type of prosthetic valve to use. The mechanical metal valves are extremely durable, but it requires ongoing anticoagulant therapy with Coumadin after valve replacement. Biologic or tissue valves are less durable, but they do not require ongoing Coumadin therapy unless one's cardiac rhythm dictates the use of the anticoagulant. The critical factor in carcinoid heart disease appears to be the serotonin level. And we're extremely attuned to this in patients who undergo replacement of their valves. In fact, we outline what is going to take place after we do open heart surgery, and we recommend that tumor reductive procedures take place within six weeks of doing the valve surgery because we have documented a 46% recurrence of fibrosis with bioprosthetic tissue valves. And uh, telotristat might change this situation, but it has not yet been proven that you can prevent recurrence of the scarring with the use of this drug which reduces serotonin. I'll have more comments about this later. These are images of the tissue valves over here. And one image of a bi-leaflet, two-leaflet mechanical valve. Other procedures that might be required are closing the interatrial defects, the atrial septal defect or the patent foramen ovale. If there's carcinoid tumor, a metastasis within the heart, usually we treat them with chemotherapy. And we monitor them with serial MRIs or CT scans. Rarely is surgical excision required, uh, and it would be required if a tumor is in a critical location within the heart. There are other potential procedures that can be done for the valvular disease of carcinoid heart disease, and that is a, a balloon valvuloplasty. We can in, in occasionally, for an isolate, isolated stenosis, that's an isolated narrowing of a valve, uh, use a balloon valvuloplasty to open a narrowed valve. However, the disease usually involves a combined stenosis and insufficiency of more than one valve. So it's rare that we can get by with just doing a balloon, balloon valvuloplasty. We've had one or two instances in which patients with tissue prosthetic valves that re have re-stenosed have been able to get by with a balloon valvuloplasty. However, now on the horizon and experimental at the present time, is the transcatheter valve replacement. Now you've probably heard of the transcatheter replacement of the aortic valve for an isolated stenosis of the aortic valve. It's been in the news quite uh, frequently. However, Carl Stangl at the University of Berlin has now used that same procedure, feeding a tissue valve through the veins up to the heart and into the position of the pulmonic valve and has replaced the pulmonic valve without open heart surgery. He's done it successfully. I've seen the images. And in addition, although he cannot do that for a tricuspid valve, he has placed a valve in the inferior vena cava to prevent the high back pressure on the liver. He's done that successfully. And in rare instances, is it necessary to also place a valve 
in the superior vena cava to prevent the engorgement of the head. It's rarely necessary, but he has done both of those. Other cardiopulmonary procedures include, you know, our patients sometimes are like any other patients. They sometimes require pacemakers for conduction blocks. Uh, this prevents the slowing of the rhythm, which can cause fainting. And in rare instances, do we have to remove the scarred lining around the lung? That's called a decortication, and it's for entrapment of the lung, and this will alleviate shortness of breath. Concerning the medical therapy of carcinoid heart disease, we use somatostatin analogs to inhibit tumor and reduce serotonin. We use diuretics to remove the excessive fluid, beta blockers to control the heart rate, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, which take the workload off the heart by uh, their vasodilating property and lowering of blood pressure, digoxin, which strengthens the contractility of the heart and helps control its rhythm, a drug called ketanserin is a potent vasodilator which can reduce pulmonary hypertension. And the experimental drug telotrostat, which is most hopeful because it has the potential. Uh, it's a tryptophan hydroxylase inhibitor. The, it, it blocks the formation of serotonin and it has the potential of reducing serotonin as, as much as 70 to 80%. This is a greater reduction of serotonin than can be achieved most times with somatostatin analogs. Now, of course, our patients have hypertension, so we have to control hypertension. You cannot ignore the treatment of cardiovascular risk factors in a carcinoid patient. The hemoglobin A1C is the diabetic marker. You have to check that. You have to treat it. Lipid markers, HDL, LDL, triglycerides, they have to be checked and treated. Homocysteine, it's a potent uh, risk factor for arteriosclerotic diseases, heart attack, and stroke. We use methylated folic acid to treat that. Other vitamins, uh, such as B12, if it's deficient, you have to treat it folic acid, vitamin D, very important, vitamin K. So we check an osteocalcin level in order to find out if you have vitamin K deficiency. And if that's very high, then that's an indication that you have to treat with vitamin K. And we're very aggressive. The Japanese have done most of the work on that. Physical activity, we have to find out if the patient is getting out of the chair. The chair is the enemy. Lifestyle. Diet, uh, the patient's emotional state, uh, is there depression? You have to pay attention to this. You have to treat the entire patient. This is a busy slide. I'm going to go through it. You don't have to read it. Uh, I'm going through it because I want you to have a feel for what we actually tell the surgeon or the anesthesiologist when they're about to do a procedure on you and you're a carcinoid patient with a carcinoid syndrome. So we do these written instructions. Number one, for prevention of a carcinoid crisis during or after surgery or the procedure. A, start an octreotide IV drip at a 100 micrograms per hour at least two hours prior the, to the procedure and continue the drip throughout the procedure and in the intensive care unit sometimes for as much as 24 to 48 hours following the procedure or until the patient is stable. B, for signs or symptoms of a carcinoid crisis, and we define it for them, flushing, diarrhea, wheezing, and or extreme increase or decrease of blood pressure, give an extra 100 microgram bolus of octreotide IV and increase the drip to 200 micrograms per hour. C, for persistence or recurrence of a crisis, give a repeat bolus of octreotide, 100 microgram IV, and increase the drip to 300 micrograms per hour. And repeat IV boluses and increase the drip by 100 microgram per hour increments as often as is necessary. We've used doses as high as 500 micrograms per hour. 
without significant adverse effects, and others have used even higher doses. Number two, to inhibit tumor release of bradykinin, which causes marked hypotension, drop in blood pressure, shock, give 100 microgram solucortef IV on call to the cath lab or the procedure. And number three, avoid adrenergic pressure, pressors. The exception is vasopressin. Treat a low blood pressure with fluids, solucortef, and octreotide. Avoid anesthetics and analgesics which stimulate adrenergic response. And I tell them that I'm available, Dr. Warner is available during the entire surgical procedure by phone and post-operatively 24-7. And I give my three phone numbers. My patients also have my, my phone numbers. The timing of procedures is critical. In the absence of right heart failure, abdominal tumor reductive procedures can proceed. In the presence of right heart failure, fix the heart first, then reduce the tumor burden and serotonin levels. Often, right heart failure is quite advanced when the patient is first seen by a cardiologist. Other effects of cancer and therapy upon the heart, anti-tumor drugs such as adriamycin can cause heart failure. So we monitor these patients with an echocardiogram before each successive dose of adriamycin. Monoclonal antibodies can adversely affect cardiac function. Other effects of cancer upon the heart, the nutritional risk caused by diminished appetite. Heart failure causes ascites and bowel edema and ultimate malnutrition, cardiac cachexia, as I mentioned before. Other causes of heart failure, hypertension. It's by definition stage one heart failure. So if one has hypertension, you have to understand that this is early heart failure and it must be treated. Non-carcinoid valve disease occurs in some of our patients. Physicians know that hypertension plus valve disease equals an increased risk of heart failure. Other causes of heart failure, our patients sometimes have had a myocardial infarction producing a scar. And coronary heart disease can actually cause what we term global ischemia, a very poorly contracting heart. It's a rare cause of it, but you have to think of it, and you have to do a coronary angiogram if you see that, because fixing coronary arteries can restore the function of the heart. Congenital heart disease can be a problem, causing hypertrophy or thickening of the walls of the heart infiltrative diseases such as amyloidosis and other congenital endocardial diseases cause loss of compliance and decreased contraction of the heart. And of course, congenital heart disease can involve anatomical, anatomic and valvular anomalies. The symptoms of heart failure. The symptoms of left heart failure are shortness of breath, chest tightness and palpitations. Those of right heart failure are exertional fatigue, liver pain, abdominal fluid or ascites, and of course, lower extremity edema. So how do we prevent or treat heart failure? We, number one, control blood pressure. We use di vasodilators, beta blockers, and diuretics. And we repair or replace whatever valves are diseased, left heart valves or right heart valves. And then we try to prevent progressive endocardial scarring. 
And to do that, we use somatostatin analogs. And I think it's possible, we have not proven this, telotrostat may prove even more promising. How do we treat right heart failure? Well, first we treat left heart failure because that's the most common cause in non-carcinoid patients of right heart failure. Then we treat reversible pulmonary disease, and then we treat chronic pulmonary embolism, pulmonary hypertension, vasoconstriction. We must rule out deep vein thrombosis, blood clots in the legs, and we use anticoagulation and vasodilator therapy. And in some instances where there's recurrent traveling of blood clots from the legs to the lungs, we insert an inferior vena cava filter. So here's our case presentation. A typical referral that I get is a phone call from Dick Warner. He tells me there's a 62-year-old male who has a six-year history of diarrhea, which has been diagnosed and treated as irritable bowel syndrome. The patient has a two-year history of flushing and occasional mid-abdominal pain. He tells me that an abdominal CT recently revealed five liver nodules, a mesenteric mass with a spiculated calcified pattern, ascites, bilateral pleural effusions, and he's done a physical exam which has shown neck vein distension with prominent V waves. That means every time the heart pumps, there's a pulsation in the neck. He hears with the stethoscope systolic murmurs. He feels with his hand that there's a pulsatile liver edge, which when you apply pressure causes hepatojugular reflux. That means when he presses on the liver, there's a transmission of pressure to the neck and he can see the neck veins distend when he presses on the liver. And he tells me that there's edema all the way up to the lower ribs. Upper endoscopy and colonoscopy failed to reveal a primary tumor. They didn't see any primary tumor. Patient has a very high urinary 5-HIAA, the breakdown product of serotonin, and blood markers, serotonin, chromogranin A, and pancreastatin are all elevated. So what do we know before I've even met the patient? Well, the patient had undiagnosed diarrhea for a long period of time. That's kind of typical, isn't it, of carcinoid? Patient has flushing. He gave a second hint, abdominal pain. And then the CAT scan, it shows metastatic lesions in the liver with a mesenteric mass. What is that mesenteric mass? They look for a primary with upper and lower uh, imaging. And they didn't find the primary. What is that mass? So typically, this is a regional lymph node adjacent to a primary, which is secreting the serotonin. The primary apparently is not secreting very much serotonin. But the metastatic lesion adjacent to it is secreting serotonin, causing scarring, and ultimate calcification. And we can see that. So even though they have not found a primary, we can tell the surgeon, you better look for a primary adjacent to that mass. And there's a clinical pearl here. Resection of the primary tumor results in prolonged survival. When they've compared those in whom they've looked for even a tiny primary and removed it, those patients live longer than those in whom they did not look for the primary and they did not find it. And of course, the effusions, the edema, the jugular venous distension, those are manifestations of carcinoid heart disease. What does it all mean to the patient? Well, knowledge of how cancer affects one's heart and how one's heart affects one's cancer empowers us to do something. And we believe, as you will hear from all the others, 
that a team approach to the cancer patient is the only way to do it. No one person can cover all the bases. The patient is the most important team member. The patient is involved in all decisions. If the focus is on the patient, you can't go wrong. As soon as you shift the focus, that's when things happen. Collaboration among the team is critical. The main ingredients are courage and persistence. What are the rewards of repairing the heart? Well, it eliminates heart failure thereby enabling a safe abdominal tumor reductive procedure. It eliminates edema, ascites, pleural effusions. It, it improves the patient's mobility. It cures malnutrition. It eliminates shortness of breath. So the rewards of doing something about cardiovascular risk reduction are that repairing the body and fighting the cancer provides a greater margin of safety. It's reasonable and prudent to tune the heart while targeting cancer. In summary, the management of patients with carcinoid heart disease is focused upon accurately defining the pathoanatomy, aggressively managing heart failure, enlisting the active participation of patient and family, creating the proper medical, surgical, and family team, protecting the patient from a carcinoid crisis if they undergo a procedure, prioritizing procedures, treating the whole patient, preventing recurrent valvulopathy, and ultimately transitioning the patient to their next phase of anti-tumor treatment. Thank you, and I wish to thank my colleagues at Sinai Center for Carcinoid and Neuroendocrine Tumors who, as do I, feel so strongly that a team approach is the formula for success. These are the members of our carcinoid and neuroendocrine tumor center with, you can see Richard Warner up, up at top. He is the person who, whose concept of a team dates back probably more than 25 years. And he has pulled our group together, created the carcinoid and neuroendocrine tumor center, and has taught me essentially everything I know about these diseases. These are my favorite slides. This is Dick Warner by his airplane. And many of you know that he has flown up and down the eastern seaboard seeing patients and collecting samples for tumor markers. And uh, yes, he's the pilot. And I'll end with this view of a sunset, which I took from the co-pilot seat. 